The British monarchy is dying and no public relations campaign can save it. The world has largely ignored the anniversary of Queen Elizabeth II's death, a testament to how little the royal family means. Anti-royal protesters stand at the Queen Victoria Memorial on the first anniversary of the death of Britain's Queen Elizabeth II, at Buckingham Palace in London, Friday, September 8, 2023. Welcome to Royal Pancakes. If you are new here, please don't forget to subscribe and click the notifications bell, so you don't miss any news about the British monarchy. With gunshots and ringing of bells, Britain marks the first anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth II and the ascension of King Charles III, who his mother remembered as a symbol of stability during her 70-year reign. The British monarch should have been under hospice care by now. At the very least, it would mark the merciful end of an impoverished and empty institution that has emerged as a dying artifact of a brutal, imperialist past that must be buried once and for all. Despite the determined efforts of royal historians and journalists who embarrass themselves and the profession they claim to pursue, the long, inevitable descent into the irrelevant farce of King Charles III and his insignificant entourage has still been once made clear. Besides her divided family and the cowardly voters who, out of nostalgic temperament and career necessity, prostrate themselves before the grandeur of a glittering anachronism, few others noticed that, Unlike many of her less fortunate ancestors, the 70-year reign of an old woman curved lady was finished a year ago due to natural causes. At the time, an army of sentimentalists assured us that Elizabeth's quiet grace and exceptional longevity had left a deep and indelible impression on a commonwealth paralyzed by grief at the sad departure of the only queen most citizens had known. It turns out that Elizabeth's tenure as monarch, ten years after, was as short-lived as a gust of wind and, frankly, far less severe than the results of that weekend's Premier League matches. Of course, there were the familiar television rituals that confirmed that Elizabeth had indeed been remembered. But they looked tired and performing. A group of Londoners were, of course, invited to place flowers at the gates of Buckingham Palace, while a thin line of celebrities greeted Charles and a conga line of major and minor league royalty took hasty walks during church services commemorative. Later, the Prince and Princess of Wales took to social media to say, we all miss you. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak released a poor statement written by a speechwriter to mark the solemn anniversary. With the prospect of a year, the scope of His Majesty's service seems only greater, he said. His commitment to the nations of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth appears to only be strengthening. And our gratitude for such an extraordinary life of duty and dedication continues to grow. At the risk of provoking a barrage of insults aimed at my blind and heartless self, I fail to understand who constitutes this imaginary us who all miss the ridiculously rich and spoiled queen for life. Not me. Honestly, right? As for Sunak's claim that the scale of Elizabeth's service, duties and dedication has only increased in the twelve months since her death at the age of 96, I challenge anyone to even find a hint of tangible non-rhetorical evidence to support this predictable piece dot of absurd historical revisionism. Elizabeth devoted her comfortable life to traveling first class, protecting her family's immense wealth from the taxman, managing her family's pristine and sprawling estates, receiving lavish state dinners through luck and entitlement from birth, to taking care of his beloved dogs and horses, and much more to restore his image, the illusion that the British monarchy is still an example of stability charity and benevolence.